Hello and welcome to Attracting Bluebirds. My name is Liz Magnanti and I manage the birdhouse in Rochester, New York. And today we are talking about how to attract bluebirds to your yard or your landscape. And there's several different things you can do and uh, we will get started. So this is the bird we're talking about today. This is the bluebird and this is the eastern bluebird which we will be focusing on. And this is the male. They have really bright, bright blue feathers along their back and along their face and they have a rusty colored breast and they also have some white down towards their belly there and um, that rusty color reminds me of one of their relatives if you will the robin they are in the same family as robins which is the thrush family and um, they are a pretty chubby bird if you think about a robin their their feathers aren't as long as a robin but they're similar in size and this is a bluebird in its natural habitat, if you will. So don't be discouraged if you've never seen a bluebird in your yard. They can be kind of hard to attract. They do like a very specific type of habitat. So they like an open area um, and, and uh, usually lined with trees. Those trees provide them with nesting cavities. They are a little bit different than most thrushes in that they do nest in cavities and most thrushes do not but they do like to have a nice wide open area where they can easily hunt for insects and that's their main source of their diet. So um, places to look for bluebirds would be meadows, fields, even golf courses they can be found at. They like to perch usually on something pretty tall, so a fence post or even a bluebird house if there's houses out in, in the meadow or in a field, they'll perch right on top. Uh, telephone wires is another good place to look for them if you're in this type of habitat. Look around if there's different phone wires around and you might see some bluebirds perched right on top of them. This is the bluebird range. So this is the range for the eastern bluebird and you can see where we live. We do have them all year round. Um, they are not as common here in the winter time. A lot of them do migrate south. They don't necessarily do a, a long migration. Some of them will just migrate a little bit further south to southern states like Pennsylvania or even Virginia, North Carolina. They don't necessarily have a full migration like other songbirds that we know, like an oriole, for example. But um, we do have them here all year round, and we even get some that will spend the winter here that were up a little bit further north in Canada. So while they aren't as common here in the wintertime, you can find them here, and when they are here in the winter, they have switched from that diet of insects to fruit and berries. So you can find them sometimes visiting shrubs or trees that have a lot of fruit in them. If you ever do some traveling and go out west, you might see this bird. This is the western bluebird. So this is a relative of the eastern bluebird and they do have some overlap in their range, but you're really not going to see them until you get out to the Midwest. And they do have darker coloration on their feathers. They're not as bright, bright blue as the eastern bluebird. And then another bluebird you might see is going to be the mountain bluebird. And this is the other species of bluebird we have here. In the continental U.S., there's three species, and this is the third. And the mountain bluebird is more of a powdery blue color, so it doesn't have that uh, reddish tone on its breast at all. And this is another western species of bluebird. So here are some ways you can attract bluebirds to your yard. First of all, bluebirds love bird baths. Bluebirds love water. Um, not all birds will come to a feeder or come to a house, but all birds do need some kind of water to survive. They use it to clean their feathers and they use it to drink. So water is a great thing that you can put out for birds, bluebirds included. On the right there, you can see the bluebird is hunker down in the blue in the in the bird bath and there's rocks all around it and rocks are a good thing you can put in your bird bath especially if it's deep not all birds like a very deep bird bath you might get robins or blue jays that will go into a deep bird bath and really splash around but smaller birds do need something a little bit more shallow in order to clean their feathers and to drink from easily so if you put rocks in your bird bath that just staggers the levels of the water so it makes it easier for the smaller birds to get into as well as the larger birds and if you can have moving water moving water is even better so birds are attracted to uh, the sight and the sound of moving water 
and you can create a moving water by um, putting in a water feature in your yard. Or even if you have a bird bath, you can add what's called a solar fountain insert. It uh, has a little solar panel on it, and a, which attaches to a pump. And that pump, once the sun hits it, will make the water move, and that can attract a lot more birds to your yard. And uh, especially in the spring, as we get migrants coming through, people get sometimes scarlet tanagers, they get warblers coming to some kind of moving water feature like this. And depending on what kind of moving water you have, if it's a little mist shooting up in the air, you might even get hummingbirds that are flying through it, which is really fun. So bluebirds do nest in houses. They are a cavity nester, unlike most of their family members, if you will. Most of the thrushes do not nest in houses. If you're putting up a bluebird house, you want to make sure that it's facing east. If possible, they do have a preference. And this goes for a lot of bird species. They do seem to prefer nesting cavities that face east. And their preference is east first, and then north, south, and west, and that's in order. So they do seem to have their preferences. And again, it's not 100%. None of this is 100%. If you put out a bluebird house in your yard and it's facing north, that doesn't mean that you're doomed for failure. But if you can have a face east, do that because that will give you the best chance of getting a bluebird in your house. Uh, mounting a bluebird house, you want to make sure it's a few feet off the ground, preferably about five feet off the ground. And that just makes it less vulnerable for predators, especially cats, if you have cats in the yard. And then you can also put up a baffle, what's called on the pole. And the baffle will keep predators from climbing up the pole like a squirrel. Um, depending where you live in the state, you might also get black rat snakes. And they are, uh, they're pretty notorious for raiding nest boxes as well. Here in upstate New York, I don't see them too often. I know we do have them around, but they're not as bad as they are in other areas, especially if you go a little bit further south. Um, but if you hear about snake baffles, that's what it's really for. You don't have to worry about a garter snake necessarily climbing up the pole to getting into your nest box. It's going to be really the, those big black rat snakes. And if you had them in your yard, you would, you would know it. <laughs> so what makes a bluebird house is going to be the size of the opening of the hole. And because bluebirds are a fairly large bird, they do need a, an opening that's large so they can fit inside. So you want to make sure you get an opening that's a, a house with an opening that's at least an inch and a half in diameter. And that will allow for the bird to fit in. It also allows for other birds to fit in. Um, and if the hole isn't big enough, sometimes animals will make it bigger so they can fit inside. This is a common sight that either a squirrel will chew around the hole to make it larger. Woodpeckers will do this. Sometimes even sparrows will, will whittle away at holes to make them bigger so they can fit inside the house. There are things you can do to prevent that. This is a metal guard that will go over the opening of your birdhouse and that will just make the hole size whatever you want it. So those range, you can get them small enough so only a wren will fit in or a wren and a chickadee or you can make it so they're larger so a bluebird can fit in it but you don't have to worry about a squirrel chewing to make it large enough that, that they could fit inside. Another thing you can do is put up what's called a bird guardian. And I have heard that these also help keep sparrows out. Um, it's not 100% like most things, but having this type of tunnel entrance isn't a preferred method of, um, of an entrance hole for a house for sparrows. Sparrows tend to like a house that doesn't have this kind of tunnel feature when they're going inside. Bluebirds are used to naturally nesting in um, uh, cavities of trees. So this is a very natural type of thing for them to have to go into to get to their nesting cavity. So these little tunnels you put on the outside of the house and not only are they kind of sparrow resistant, but they also make it so mammals like raccoons or squirrels that might climb up the pole to get into the house. Um, it makes it that entrance just that much longer so they can't reach their arms inside and angle them down to get the nestlings or the eggs. And they will sometimes raid the nest of the eggs or the nestlings themselves. So this just does help them keep out. So this is what a bluebird nest looks like. 
And when, um, when they're building a nest, the male will start bringing in some long, tall grasses into the nest and then he'll perch on top and he'll wave his feathers around to try to attract a female. You might hear them singing their signature song. But once the female comes to the nesting site, she'll continue to build the nest. The male doesn't really build the nest, he just starts it. He entices the female to come in. She'll continue to build the nest, which is made of really long grasses. And inside she will lay her eggs. And um, they have usually an average of four to five eggs, but they can be as many as two to seven eggs. And their eggs are a light blue color. It kind of reminds you of the robin eggs, which you may have seen before. They can have anywhere from two to three broods, and that depends on several things usually, but the most common are going to be food scarcity. Um, if there's not that much food around, they won't necessarily be able to sustain two or three broods. They might just stick to one. Another thing can be the age of the bird. Usually older birds will have more broods, and they'll have more eggs per brood. And um, it can be weather dependent too. So right now we're having a pretty mild spring. And well, I guess we should, I should say we had a mild winter going into spring. So already there's some birds finding nesting sites and looking for places to nest. And they could be building nests right now as well. So this could be a great year for us to have multiple broods of bluebirds. And once the eggs are laid, they have an 11 to 19 day incubation period. So that's how many days the female is, is sitting on those eggs until they hatch. And once they hatch, it does not take them very long to fledge or leave the nest. It only takes 17 to 21 days for those nestlings, which when they hatch are completely naked and blind. It only takes them about two and a half to three weeks in order to become fully independent and fly out of the nest and be on their own. And this is what a nestling looks like. This is an adult feeding the nestling. So you can see they do have that little blue patch on their wings. And what's neat about the nestlings is the uh, the nestlings from the first and second brood will sometimes stick around to help raise the nestlings of the following brood. And usually the nestlings early on in the season, once it starts to get to the fall, they'll disperse, but the last brood uh, will sometimes stick around and stay with the parents all winter long before they do disperse. So if you're putting up a nest box, you might have had issues with these guys. These are the house sparrows. And um, bluebirds were actually in decline for quite a while. In the early 1900s, house sparrows and European starlings were introduced to America. And because they are also cavity nesters, they created a lot of competition for nesting sites. So from the early 1900s to about the early 1960s or so, uh, bluebirds were in really large declines. But um, starting around the 1960s, going into the 1970s, uh, people started making bluebird trails and putting up bluebird houses and that really rebounded the bluebird population to what it is today. And it is increasing more and more. So if you never had a bluebird in your yard, they, because their populations are increasing, you might be able to attract one now if you never had before. So house sparrows, like their name suggests, they do nest in houses, so they can be pretty competitive with bluebirds. This is what their nest looks like if you have a nesting box in your yard right now and you're not sure what kind of nest is in there. The house sparrow nest isn't nearly as clean as the bluebird nest is. They'll use grasses, but they'll also use feathers, they'll use plastics. It's a very messy nest and it's usually pretty powdery in there too. If you open up your nest box and there's a lot of debris in there, they're very, very messy. So that's how you can tell that it is a house sparrow. Um, if you're putting up houses, it can't hurt to put up more than one at a time. If um, you might have seen bluebird houses in pairs sometimes and the idea behind that is House sparrows can go in one and bluebirds can go in the other, so there's a reduced amount of competition for the nesting sites. And sometimes the house sparrows are so territorial that they'll keep other predatory birds away from the bluebird houses. So it can work out pretty well, uh, but let us know how it works out 
for you in the comments below here in the video. So this is a bluebird perching on top of a what's called sparrow resistant bluebird house. And like I said, nothing is 100%, but this is by far, at least at our store, our best selling birdhouse in the whole store. And it is a bluebird house. It doesn't look like your typical bluebird house, but it has a different type of opening. It has a rectangular type of opening and bluebirds will go in there just fine, but sparrows tend to like a circular type of opening. And then another thing about it is that it is a very small nesting cavity and it's hard to tell from the picture, but it is a small space. And sparrows do like a deep nesting cavity. They like a lot of room, but sparrows don't, or bluebirds don't mind more of a confined space. So this is a great way to attract bluebirds and keep the sparrows away. It just doesn't have the specs that a sparrow really likes in a house. Another thing you can do, is put out what's called a sparrow spooker and what it is is reflective tape and this is some reflective mylar tape once a bluebird has laid an egg in its house it won't abandon it so if you have some some bluebirds interested in a house and you open it up and you see there's an egg inside you can put up what's called a sparrow spooker and it's a shiny reflective tape and it's attached to the house and birds don't like shiny reflective material so it scares away other birds, including the sparrows. But because the bluebirds have uh, have started the nest and they've laid an egg, they're pretty dedicated to that space, so it won't scare them away. But you don't want to put that up until the bluebird has laid an egg in the house. If you are getting sparrows nesting inside the house or building a nest, you can remove that nest. The house sparrows, because they are an invasive species, they're not protected, so you can remove the nest. You could remove their net, their eggs, you could re remove the nestlings or the birds themselves if you wish to. Here's some more pictures of sparrow spookers. They're not the most beautiful things, but um, any way that you, can, uh, that you can adhere some shiny reflective material to a birdhouse like this um, to keep the birds away, especially from perching on the top where they like to perch and call for a mate, that will really help keep them away. So if you put out a bluebird house, you might get these guys too. These are tree swallows and they occupy the same type of habitat as the bluebirds do. So they like the nice open areas. They are often found what's called on the wing, flying around a lot in meadows and in fields where they will catch insects midair. And their nests are made out of a lot of feathers. So they'll use a lot of times their own feathers they'll pull out to make a nest. And they're very bright, bright white. So if you open up your bluebird house and there's a lot of feathers in there, it's probably a tree swallow. And then there's, of course, the wrens will nest in houses, sometimes even bluebird houses. And you know you have a wren when there's a lot of sticks in the house. And there's, they have a similar behavior to the bluebirds where the male will start building a nest in the house, perch on top of it and sing and sing and sing, and he'll attract a female to it. Meanwhile, he's done this in several other places. He's started to build a nest. And then the female will choose which place she wants to nest in. So if you've ever had a, a birdhouse that has just a little layer of sticks and you never had anything nest in it, that was from a wren. He uh, started building a nest and the female just didn't approve, so they went elsewhere. But this is what a typical wren house looks like. And this is the Carolina wren and the house wren. They're both common species we have here that you might see nesting in, uh, in your house. And then of course there's chickadees and they are very common nesting species in cavities, and they use a lot of moss in their nests. So if you've got a nest with that's pretty small with a lot of moss, that's gonna be your chickadee nest. So another way you can attract bluebirds to your yard is by putting out food for them. And we mentioned that they are insect eaters. So the best kind of food you can put out for them would be mealworms. And you can get live mealworms or freeze-dried mealworms. They do prefer live mealworms. And if you've ever had live mealworms before, you might know that you are supposed to keep them in your refrigerator in order to keep them uh, fresh, if you will. They're actually a beetle larva. So if they get too warm over time, they'll just transform into a beetle larva and keeping them in the refrigerator just stalls that process. But they love uh, mealworms and a lot of birds do once they're young if hatched they need to feed them a lot of insects in order for them to grow so fast it only takes two or three weeks for the young to fledge and that's because they're eating so much protein they're able to grow so fast so 
putting out mealworms is a great way to attract the bluebirds. And it doesn't have to be in anything fancy. Putting out a little hanging dish is a great way to feed mealworms. And uh, as the season goes on, you might get orioles or woodpeckers, different types of birds eating those mealworms. If you've ever seen a contraption like this, it looks like uh, on, the, on the left here, it looks like a house mixed with a feeder. This is a bluebird feeder and there's plexiglass on the side and a little dish inside. And um, inside you put the mealworms in that little cup and the hole is made for the bluebirds to come and go. And the idea behind this is bluebirds are so used to coming and going from cavities that they'll go inside the feeder, be able to get the mealworms they want and then leave. Whereas other birds are a little bit more timid and won't go inside. If you've ever tried a feeder like this and you didn't have success, one thing you can do is take the plexiglass out of one of the sides. Uh, birds will get used to coming to the feeder and then you can replace the plexiglass again and ultimately they'll learn to go in and out of the hole. So if you want to attract bluebirds, we do have a few easy recommendations. First of all, put out nesting boxes. You want to put out at least two. And bluebirds do like a house that's stationary. So that's pretty common with most birds. So you don't want it swinging around in the wind in a tree. Um, you want it stationary. So the best way to do that is put it on a pole. If you put out at least two, that'll help with the competition. So I think just about all of us have house sparrows pretty commonly in their yard. And if you put out two nest boxes, uh, the house sparrows can go in one and hopefully you can get another type of species of bird, preferably a bluebird, going into the other one. Live mealworms are delicious and the bluebirds love them. So live mealworms are great. You can also do freeze dried mealworms. They're not their favorites, but they will still eat them, especially if you, uh, if you spray the, the freeze dried mealworms with some water or soak them in water. They'll absorb that water and they'll get more plump and they just look more alive, if you will. And then adding running water. So converting your bird bath into a little fountain feature. Not only might you get bluebirds, but you could be amazed by the different types of birds that you get. And then be patient. It can take a while to attract bluebirds. They're not the easiest bird to attract, but they are becoming more and more common in backyards. So don't get discouraged if you don't get them right away uh, as you put out your house and your feeder. So just be patient and in the meantime, enjoy the other birds that you have in your yard. Well, thank you so much for watching again. We'll be having more classes online like this and we're always looking for your feedback. So feel free to send an email to info at thebirdhouseny.com. Visit our website at thebirdhouseny.com where you can find more information about bluebirds and you can buy some of the items that we pictured here online. And uh, you can also leave your comments below in the YouTube link here. So thank you so much again. And we're always looking for uh, new ideas for classes. So feel free to share those with us as well.